Good morning. Help, welcome to the house of the Lord as we celebrate and worship together. Uh, they are working on uh, getting the air to circulate again for us, and we're apologizing for any kind of warmth. But some of you said it's so cold most Sundays, so you don't mind at all. It's like sitting on a boat. <laughs> so hopefully you'll be fine. We're excited to uh, announce that we did have a delivery. Uh, Marie and Jojo uh, got a really big delivery for Honduras, our clothing collection. So let's be thankful for that. We also have our church council uh, after a service. If the AC is still not running, I may say let's move it into the parlor. I think we could all fit in there. Uh, does that sound good? Yeah. <laughs> okay. We also have openings in our preschool and aftercare, and that's going well, so we uh, celebrate that ministry. Let us stand together for our opening hymn, What Wondrous Love Is This? our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Our first text comes to us from Mark 12, verses 30 and 31. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. From Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. Teacher, he asked, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And finally, from 1 John 4, 16 through 21. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love, and whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or a sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. O Lord, as we come before you, open our hearts and minds to hear the message you have for us this day. You are our rock and our redeemer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we conclude our three-part series on the three simple rules. John Wesley looked to uh, Matthew 22 and Micah 6.8 to get the background for these three simple rules for life. The first was to do no harm, the second to do good, and the third to stay in love with God and your neighbor by practicing your faith. There's a little book by a bishop named Reuben Job. It was written in 2007, and he revisited these three simple rules because he felt like the Methodist Church has, had lost touch of these. He said, if all of us who are Methodists would practice these three simple rules, what a different world we would live in. And then imagine if we shared those kind of concepts and rules in our workplace, in our home, in our schools, do no harm, do good. Stay in love with God and your neighbor. The essentials of our relationship to God and each other are modeled in Jesus Christ. Just like Jesus, we become channels of God's presence and message and even power at our time and our place in history. We as a church are intended to be the beloved community that reflects something different than the world reflects. At our best, we resemble Christ as his body now on earth with compassion and mercy being our calling cards. When Jesus is asked by a young lawyer, an attorney, what is the greatest law? What is the greatest command? He pairs two together. Now you have to remember in the Jewish tradition, law is the highest office. The judges were the highest office. And this young man is trying to understand with over 600 rules, in the Jewish tradition, what is the most important? And Jesus says, these two, and they go together. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Now these two are not new to Jesus. They already existed in the Old Testament. The first is from Deuteronomy 6.5. There is but one God, and you shall love him with your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind. And the second was from Leviticus 19, 18. You shall love your neighbor. He adds, even as you love yourself. Why do you think Jesus added that? Perhaps he knew what psychologists know today, that if you start with self-loathing, and low opinion of yourself, you are very likely to project that onto everyone else. If you have not yet received God's forgiveness and healing and love, start there. Once you can receive it, then you in turn can share it. For Jesus, these two could never be separated. John refers to this again when he says we love because Jesus and God first loved us. God loved us first, and this gives us the channel of grace to share with others. When Wesley first penned these words, these three simple rules, he wrote, stay in love with God by practicing the ordinances. Most of us don't use that word today unless you're in the field of law. What is an ordinance? 
It is a mandate, a decree, something that is fixed. So he is asking us to look at the scripture and see what is mandated, what is fixed in the law of God, love of God and love of neighbor. He is showing us that the way to love God is through obedience, just as Jesus showed us. We're given essential practices to build up our faith and in turn draw closer to God and each other. Think for a moment, what are the essential practices that help you stay in love with God? For some, it's recognizing God in nature, just simply saying, wow. For others and for most, it is worship and prayer, fellowship and scripture, participating in something within the church walls and something beyond the church walls that honors God. For many, it's music. Countless people have told me how the music speaks to their soul and reminds them of God's great love. Recognizing God's handiwork in both the little and the big things all around us and the miracles of relationship and connection. Hearing about God's love for us. You see, our beliefs inform our behavior Our principles guide our own performance. Our confessions direct our own character. Philippians 4, 8 reminds us, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, think on these things. Whatever is excellent and praiseworthy, Think on these things. Jesus goes on to reveal that what we say we believe is not worth much unless it's manifested in how we live. Our thoughts, our words, our deeds. James tells us, be doers of the word, not hearers only. Jesus pairs the love of God and love of neighbor and a healthy love of ourself together as the highest commandments and laws of God. Wesley called our love of neighbor our acts of mercy. We see that in the fruit of the Spirit. Kindness, love, awareness of our neighbor steps to address the needs of our neighbor hospitality to the stranger, the welcome that we share. James 1.8 tells us if you love your neighbor as you love yourself, you are doing well. You are commended when you can love your neighbor as you love yourself. In our culture today, many are isolated, disconnected from one another. People are hungry for authentic connection. There was a research and poll done that 56% of young adults tune into some kind of church online and yet don't necessarily go to church. You see, loneliness and grief and suspicion have left us in the position of hiding behind social media or trapped even in our own homes, not sure how to engage with one another. We are all hungry for truth and love, yet anxious about how to access it without getting hurt. It helps us to remember as the church, we are intended and called to be that safe place that people can connect. We're all hungry, hungry for what God alone can offer to us. Pastor Rick Warren, in his message about loving our neighbor, points to five ways we can be faithful in loving our neighbor, get to know them, 
and be friendly about it in day-to-day -day interaction. Encourage others. Make yourself known as an encourager, not a discourager. Help cheer them. Bring hope rather than complaint. Three, serve them cheerfully, kindly. Four, invite them to watch church online, to visit church with you. And five, probably one of the most important, help others find a way that they can serve and feel useful. Not just serving them, but helping them see their service is very valuable. Our attitude affects everything we do and our love of God and our love of neighbor, even in our love of ourself. 1 Peter 4.10 tells us we are given many gifts to bless and to serve each other, not for our own edification. Sharing and helping and caring builds a beloved community here and out beyond these walls. If you recall the Good Samaritan story, it was Jesus' way of explaining that the one who shows mercy is the great and good neighbor. You see, the priest and the Levite walked away from this hurting man because they were thinking, what will happen to me if I stop? But the Good Samaritan instead is thinking, what will happen to him? if I don't stop. You see the difference. Love of neighbor is an expression of our love of God. A few years ago, there was a campaign called Random Acts of Kindness. There was another one recently just called Be Nice. It had t-shirts and bumper stickers, but I think what Jesus is asking of us is not random. It's intentional, intentionally, daily, looking for ways to be kind. I remember there were a group of people who would buy a Starbucks coffee for the person behind them, and someone said, instead of buying that Starbucks coffee, why don't you call the local school and see if you can pay off the food account for some of the children who can't afford their lunch? Look for ways to be kind. Each of us has many opportunities every day in our actions and our attitudes. It means living our lives with good morals and motives directed by our faith in God. Each attribute is distinct, yet scripture refers to the fruit of the spirit as the fruit all the fruit coming together. Love, peace, patience, joy, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The fruit we bear as Christ followers. It's no coincidence that Paul puts love first on the list. Love of God and love of neighbor it warms God's heart. It delights God when he sees us enjoying each other's company, when he hears our laughter instead of our cries. But God also hears our cries. He hears our pain. One of my favorite books uh, is by Brother Lawrence. It's called Practicing the Presence of God. And he was living in a monastery, and he was cooking and cleaning, and he said, Every pot I wash, I thank God for my community, for the people that just ate this meal together. Every time I wash the clothes, I shake it out and I say, bless Brother Lawrence, bless Brother Matthew, bless whoever wears this garment. I learned about it at a fairly young age and did it myself. Bless those 
who wear these things I've just washed. It means a lot. Tell your family, tell those that you have washed and blessed that shirt. You see, practicing the presence of God is to love our neighbor. And Martin Luther said the closest neighbor is the ones or the ones that we call family. And if there isn't a family, those who are living beside us or those we encounter each day. There's a beautiful story called The Messiah is Among Us. Once upon a time, there was a wise abbot of a monastery who was a good friend of a rabbi who was also wise. It was in the old country long ago when times were hard and the abbot's community was struggling and dwindling and sometimes the monks just seemed fearful and weak and anxious. He went to his friend, the rabbi, and wept. What am I to do? with this band of brothers. And the rabbi said, there's something you need to know. We have long known in the Jewish community that the Messiah is one of you. What? he exclaimed. One of us? How can this be? The rabbi insisted. The abbot returned to the abbey in a different way. The Messiah is one of us. He began to treat everyone with great dignity and respect and listened carefully to each word. It began to catch on and people were saying, you know, what is the difference? What's going on? And people whispered, the abbot has found out that the Messiah is one of us. All of a sudden, the worship improved, the music is devout and singing beautifully, and the neighborhood and the community began to go to the abbey to hear this great music and see these kind souls. They say, still, that if you come across a place and a people where life is based on love and kindness and respect, and graciousness, the Messiah is truly among them. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our song of reflection, I love you, Lord. come forward to receive our offering we are so grateful for every opportunity that we together can offer our service our tithes and our offerings to God to use in ministry 
to make an impact for good and for God in this community. The ushers come forward at this time.
Oh Lord, we offer these gifts as an expression of our gratitude for your wondrous love in Jesus Christ. Enable us to be your faithful people as we love you and we love our neighbor, even as we gently love ourselves. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. O oh God, as we receive the blessing of your love and your forgiveness and your healing, may we receive it completely because it is in that great love that we in turn can stand ready to be your faithful disciples to extend that grace, that love, and that mercy to our neighbor. O oh God, you call forth the best in us and forgive us for that which is not the best. Forgive us when we fail, when we fall, when we need your strength, your spirit, to equip us and guide us and empower us to be your faithful community to touch lives for good. Help us, O oh God. We're so grateful, O oh God, for each gift, the breath of each day, the beauty of your creation, the splendor of your grace. And we offer our prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand for our closing hymn. Let us receive God's blessing and benediction. I also invite you to the parlor where there's lots of air conditioning and refreshments from water to iced tea to coffee. Uh, and then we'll have our council meeting. I think we'll probably move it in there as well around 11, between 11 or 11.15. We'll see how everybody moves in. Let us receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face and love 
to shine upon you, that you too would receive the forgiveness and you can stand in his grace. Help us, O oh God, show the world your love. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you.